If you were looking for a superstar face for the conundrum of the so-called steroid era in Major League Baseball, you couldn't do much better than Jeff Bagwell. Here was a player who looked like a good bet to someday land a roster spot with the Boston Red Sox until they traded him to the Houston Astros for uh, Larry Anderson in the 1990 trade deadline. At that point, Bagwell had never hit more than four homers in a minor league season, though he did smack 34 doubles for the New Britain Red Sox while recording a .333 average. Despite the questions about his power, Bagwell opened the 1991 season as Houston's starting first baseman and never looked back. He was named National League Rookie of the Year after an opening campaign that saw him hit 294 with 79 runs and 82 RBI. Power Surge what really was surprising, though, was his power stroke, good enough for 15 dingers. His muscle continued to ratchet up over the next few years, peaking with a monster 1994 that saw him hit 39 homers with 104 runs, 116 RBI, 15 stolen bases, all backed by a gaudy 368 batting average. And he did all that in the span of just 110 games during a strike rune season. Bagwell had established himself as a legitimate and consistent power source because after the Boys of Summer resumed their fairy tale story in 1995, Bags reeled off eight straight 30 homer seasons from 1996 to 2003. Three times during that span, he topped 40 homers and narrowly missed on two other occasions. But as you know, that was the heart of the steroid era. And Bagwell had built himself from a so so power source in the minors to an outright slugger in the majors and Bagwell had admitted to using androstenedione back in 1998. In case you don't remember, androstenedione was a substance that reporters spied in Mark McGuire's locker as he chased down Roger Maris's that same summer, and it was in many ways the beginning of the scrutiny that led to the villainization of power hitters throughout the game. While Bagwell never admitted to taking anything stronger, and while there have been scant few whispers about him and the use of PED, aside from Jose Conseco's rants, Bagwell has nonetheless paid the price for the era in which he played and the shape of his career. Delayed Rewards Consider that Bagwell hit 449 home runs with a 297 average and a 202 stolen bases over his 15-year career, all with the Astros. Or that his sabermetric super scores, WAR is a 79.6 and JAWS is a 63.9, rank him as the sixth greatest first baseman of all time. The only guy ahead of him who has seen the inside of a baseball stadium during the last 50 years is Albert Pujols. Wouldn't you expect the sixth best first baseman ever and the best to come up for election in the last 60 years to sail into the Hall of Fame? You might, but Bagwell didn't. In fact, he received only 41.7% of the vote on his first ballot in 2011, and that was right in the heart of the PED outrage that gripped the game by the throat. And even the hint of extra muscle on your frame could buy you a heap of scrutiny. Without any real beef against him, Bagwell made a steady climb up the Hall of Fame ladder in subsequent years until he finally broke through in January of 2017. It took him seven ballots, but Jeff Bagwell finally did sail into Cooperstown, being named on 86.2% of the ballots. So regardless of what the whispers may have said about this legend over the last 15 years, and regardless of how long it took him to claim his spot, Bagwell has landed where he belonged all along. A flood of baggy cardboard. All that's left for us now as collectors is to dust off our old cardboard or go buy some and enjoy the magnificent player that he was. Even if you had designs on building a complete Bagwell master set, well, you can probably forget about that. PSA lists 859 items on the complete checklist, and even the most ardent of Bagwell collectors is only a little over a third of the way there. Bagwell began his career back in our day, during the boom years of the hobby. That means there aren't that many different early cards to consider, and most of them are still available in goodly quantities. With that in mind, here is the rundown of Jeff Bagwell's rookie cards, all of which you can still pick up on the cheap. And who doesn't love a good deal on Hall of Fame rookies? 1991 Bowman By 1991, Topps had already issued two Bowman sets with middling success. While collectors enjoyed the retro feel of the issue, the 1989 cards were too big to fit in standard cheats and holders, and the 1990 set was just sort of boring. 
But in 1991, tops hit on the formula that would make Bowman a staple of the day. Rookies. And lots and lots of rookies. And pre-rookies, too. Had Bowman made the switch a year earlier, we probably would have a major card with a Bagwell card in his new Britain Red Sox uniform. As it is, we have an early Astros card that pays homage to his 1990 Eastern League MVP trophy with a foil stamp in the upper left-hand corner. It's a solid first-year card of a Hall of Famer that you can buy for under $5 in nice rock condition. 1991 Donruss the Rookies when Donruss debuted the Rookies in 1986, baseball cards were like paper gold, and rookie cards in particular were seen as can't-miss investment vehicles. By 1991, it was pretty clear that everything printed after about 1981 was scarce as dirt, but we still loved our rookie cards enough to make the Rookies our annual favorite. They were like your lame cousin's birthday party that the whole family goes to every year, even though you know nothing exciting will happen. It's the possibility and the family obligation that keeps you coming back. In 1991, at least, Donruss gave us future Hall of Famers in Bagwell and Yvonne Rodriguez, as well as several other stars of the generation, including Luis Gonzalez, Chuck Knobloch, and Daryl Kyle, and Kirk Dressendorfer, of course. These days, the whole shebang will set you back less than $5, and Bagwell himself comes in under two. 1991 Fleer Update Bagwell collectors of the day were probably relieved when their guy didn't appear in the 1991 Fleer base set. He had avoided the yellow borders of death. Any associated smugness evaporated that fall, though, as Fleer made sure to include the up-and-comer in its year-end update set, replete with canary borders. While this card is as ugly as it wants to be, it's still a first-year bags issue that you can snag all day long for less than a buck. 1991 Fleer Ultra Update What their yellow horror lacked in collector appeal, Fleer attempted to recoup with the premiere of their premium set in the summer of 1991. Fleer Ultra was positioned to take aim at Leaf and later Stadium Club, and its attractive offering was really attractive at the time. Still, like pretty much every other set of the era, Ultra was grossly overproduced. The late season Ultra update may exist in slightly fewer quantities, but you can still find a bag well for a few dollars in nice ungraded condition. 1991 Leaf Gold Rookies Bagwell didn't benefit from the rarefied air of the 1990 Leaf set, and he wasn't included in the follow-up base issue in 1991. Leaf did think enough of the young first sacker to include him in their 1991 Leaf Gold Rookie set, though. These cards were randomly inserted into Series 1 and Series 2 packs of the normal Leaf cards and feature 24 promising rookies. Guys like Will Cordero, Arthur Rhodes, Mo Vaughn, Reggie Sanders. Leaf also shoehorned highlight cards for Nolan Ryan and Ricky Henderson into Series 2 packs. Today, you can find raw bags for a buck or two each, and even PSA 10 copies will fetch $20 or so. 1991 Leaf Studio In 1991, Donruss decided that we needed to see <clears throat> uh, the flirtatious side of our favorite baseball stars. To accommodate that mandate, they created Leaf Studio, featuring black and white photos of 264 players in various studio poses, many with a sort of candlelit feel. Bagwell's entry fits that general description as we find the young, hatless Astro half-smiling at us over his bat barrel while arching his eyebrows in our direction. Are we buddies? Does he want to sell us the bat? Is he going to ask us out for coffee? It's always open for interpretation with studio, but this enigma can be yours for about a dollar. 1991 score rookie and traded. Score was another company who missed out on Bagwell with her 1991 base set, but made up for it a year later. There is nothing really remarkable about Bag's rookie and traded card other than maybe the big, powerful uppercut swing that we see just past the full point of extension. If you like this card, you can probably own it for about $2. 1991 Top Stadium Club What Leaf was in 1990, Stadium Club was in 1991. That is to say, Stadium Club was a summer sensation that sent collectors scurrying for their own copies, enticed dealers to hoard whatever boxes and cases they could find, and rocketed prices through the stratosphere. A super premium issue from the most state of companies, Tops, Stadium Club reset our expectations for baseball card quality and new card prices. 
Alas, it was ultimately the case with most every issue of the era. Stadium Club turned out to be as common as Sunday Night Dread. Not even Jeff Bagwell was immune to the subsequent deflation, and you can buy this Hall of Fame rookie card for a couple of dollars on eBay and elsewhere. 1991 Top Stadium Club Members Only Tops wasn't content in 1991 to make the most slam boom crash sparkling opulent baseball cards of all time. Nope, they wanted to turn Stadium Club into an actual club, and so they did. For an annual fee, you could join the Members Only Club, a commitment which netted you a neat little package that included a subscription to Tops Magazine, a Stadium Club keychain, a bronze ingot of Nolan Ryan, a four sport 50 card Members Only box set. If you've listened this far, you won't be surprised to learn that Bagwell made the cut into the members only issue and today joins the rest of the cards in the set as some of the rarest, most valuable. Oh wait, and you can buy Bagwell for like belly button lint today. Still a cool card though. 1991 Tops Traded Tops didn't do any better than its contemporaries when it came to having the foresight to include Bagwell in their base 1991 set. But also like the others, the old gum company saw fit to issue a Bags card in their year-end traded set. Bags looks a bit um, uncomfortable in this shot, and certainly nowhere near as inviting as on, let's say, his stadium card. Still, this is the first official non-stadium club card division of a bona fide Hall of Famer, and it usually can be yours for about a dollar. 1991 Upper Deck Sitting here, you might be tempted to conclude that Upper Deck beat their competition to the punch when it came to Jeff Bagwell rookie cards. After all, Bags made it into the Upper Deck set, not the Upper Deck rookies, and the traded update opening day were catching up set. Only Bagwell sits at 755, which means he was part of the high-end 100-card series later issued that season. So when you pluck down your 99 cents for this Bagwell rookie, you really are buying an Upper Deck Rookies and traded update opening day we're catching up card. Don't let that sap your enjoyment, though, because it's still a great rookie card. 1991 Upper Deck Rookie Threats Man, I'll tell you what. Upper Deck did everything better than their competition, didn't they? I mean, first it was the Marlar packs and the cardback photos and the cardback holograms. Then it was Reggie Jackson chase cards. Then it was revolutionizing of the multiplayer rookie cards. Okay, so maybe revolutionizing is an exaggeration, and it feels like possibly not even a word. But this rookie threats card is a thousand times better than Top's old forehead in a grid layout, isn't it? Depends on what you mean by better, I suppose. Aesthetically, it's great. Value-wise, about a buck. Like our video? Then like our videos and subscribe to our channel. WaxPatGods.com